It's time for Bogish at the Plate. Here's Andrew Bogish. And welcome to the latest edition of Bogish at the Plate. Andrew Bogish, happy to have you back with us. Another 30 minutes of baseball conversation this week. As always, a lot to get to. The Houston Astros off to a slow start. We'll check in with our CBS Sports Radio affiliate uh, friend down in Houston, Mike Meltz. We'll get the latest on those Strohs, our weekly check on the fantasy front and minor league action as well. But since we last spoke, we've got two more, now three total PED suspensions in baseball. Began with Chris Calabello in Toronto, went to D. Gordon in Miami, and then most recently a Dodge reliever most of you probably didn't even know existed until the news of his suspension broke. But uh, it is certainly worth a conversation an extended one on PEDs in baseball. And for that, we welcome in Will Carroll, the managing editor at FanDuel and a must-follow on Twitter, at Injury Expert. Will, it is Andrew. Thanks so much for the time. We appreciate it. No problem. You know, it's actually more than three, Andrew. Uh, Just like uh, Josh Raven, 40-man, who you don't think of. You might not even know. Uh, There was Darren Stumpf out of uh, Philadelphia. That's right. There was was, uh, Abraham Almonte was the other one. And, of course, uh, Henry Mejia, the first three-strike player who's now theoretically banned for life. Right, who I believe is still blaming Major League Baseball, right, for trying to, like, push him out of the league or something like that or somehow do him wrong in all this? Yeah, I haven't seen the full uh, argument. He's still in the appeals process, which is as it should be. And and actually, that appeals process is something that people don't understand has become something of a sore point for some of these players, these hardline players like Justin Verlander. Um they want the appeals process to be faster. The problem is you just can't speed it up. You've got to go through all the the evidence. You've got to make sure the tests are run again and run correctly, go through the whole thing. Uh, It could be speeded up some. All these tests, every single positive test we've had so far has come from the front side of spring training, so mid to early February. And will the you know, the D Gordon one for some reason seem to to send more shockwaves than normal? Uh, I don't know specifically what the reason for that was, but when you see his name attached to this, does it does it make you make any generalizations about the nature of the problem baseball is facing right now with PEDs? No, um, you know I don't really think there is a problem. We've gotten it down from five percent, just over five percent, back in two thousand four, to less than one half of one percent that test positive today. Yeah, you know, there are always going to be people that sneak through. There are going to be people that are just dumb and get sold a bill of goods <laughs> the way the guys with Biogenesis did. Right. Um, but in this case, I think there's two things. First, we only really care when it's a big name. And D. Gordon's a big enough name. He's a batting champion. He's an all-star. He knew his father. His, his brother is an up-and-coming prospect. So people knew who he was the second is people think they can see steroids you know, some guy bulks up some guy starts hitting home runs some guy has a great season out of nowhere like Calabello did last year and you know you didn't hear anybody saying well he must have been juicing last year they were like oh what a great story he's a nice guy uh with D. Gordon it threw him off here's a speedster here's a guy who's skinny uh and uh, they they end up uh, he tests positive for t- not one but two different yeah. anabolic steroids uh, and, and and it just surprises people. And when people are surprised, they don't understand it, and they start thinking, oh, there's bigger problems. They're big. Look, these are two. I mean, one of the steroids, close to ball, I can't believe anybody's actually using it. This is an <laughs> actual East German steroid from back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it, it's detectable for 60 days. If, if you're in a testing environment and you're trying to get away with something, this is the one of the two or three last things you would ever want to try. Uh, and all I guess is look at D. Gordon, look at his stats. didn't really work for him. Uh, so I don't know why he would have used. I don't buy the, this unknowing uh, thing. You, you don't accidentally stack a couple steroids. Uh, so I think it bothers people because they've heard of him and it doesn't fit with what they expect. Yeah, and it's surprising to me still, and maybe I shouldn't be surprised, that, that people still equate all of this to Barry Bonds and huge muscles when, for the most part, I mean, the most part's not right either, but you know, a lot of this is just about feeling better day-to-day and giving yourself the chance to take extra BP, do extra work in the weight room. It's, it's about almost endurance more than it can be about sheer muscle mass. Well, it's about recovery for some yeah. people, but it's... 
you know, a lot of people think they feel better. They, they, something breaks down, they think they need to come back, and somebody sells them. You know, all those people with Biogenesis, all the people with Falco, all the guys who got caught with Red Star, all those different guys basically got sold. They got talked into some secret sauce. Well, these were no secret sauces. Uh, you know, with Biogenesis, there was absolutely no effect. Uh, the only one that's really stood out to me was the one from uh, today here here on Tuesday, uh, this Josh Raven one, because this this is a whole new substance. Uh, Major League Baseball hasn't caught someone for a peptide before, uh, and, and this is very intriguing. If they indeed did test him for it rather than catch him via the non-analytic means, uh, that's one of the first peptide positives anywhere. Uh, and, and it's certainly very telling that uh, maybe the players are getting a little bit more advanced. Well, and it's also refreshing you know, on a minor a minor level for me well, that he actually owned up to it. He said, listen, I, I lost a bunch of weight. I was sick, tried to make it back up, and took something that I shouldn't have taken. Uh, maybe that is actual still BS, but it's better than, how'd that get there? I don't know. I'm going to find the real killers. Hold on. I'll be right back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I do buy this. You know, I, yeah. it's ignorance rather than, you know, unknowing. Uh, should he have known better? Should he have checked? Uh, you know, when you have something called GHRP2, you probably ought to read the label, check with your agent, uh, call the Players Association, one of those. But I can see why he thought he would have either, you know, it's something you can buy over the counter in places and uh, certainly order over the Internet. But, uh, you know, he, he, he made his excuse, he gave his explanation, and that's more than most do. Will Carroll, the managing editor of FanDuel and at Injury Expert on Twitter with us here this week on Bogish at the Plate. So it sounds, Will, like you think Major League Baseball is actually doing a fairly good job uh, at getting these, at least in the smallest level possible, out of the game. Yeah, overall, the, you know, the testing programs are about one of two things. Major League Baseball's program, for instance, is about getting it out of the game, punishing anybody that crosses that line, and they've done a very, very good job of it to their own detriment at many points. Yeah, the, the, the Alex Rodriguez stuff, uh, it, it, they've still smeared themselves in terms of the Hall of Fame, um, but they're very, very focused on getting it out of the game, catching people, testing at all times. On the other hand, you can do it where it's just PR, and you can handle that very well. You don't have to test very much. Uh, you tell people when the tests are coming. You only test for certain periods. Uh, and still people in the NFL will manage to get caught. Uh, the NFL has an exceptional drug problem. If you think uh, guys are 6'6", 300 pounds and running five flat 40s, naturally uh, I've got a bridge to sell you. <laughs> uh, but they've, they've managed the problem very well because people don't have these same kind of questions. You know, Every time somebody runs for a long run, you don't go, well, it must be on steroids. Every time uh, a backup becomes uh, an all-star there, uh, people aren't questioning things because they've managed that process very well from a PR standpoint. Uh, getting things out of the game, not even close. Will, going back to Chris Colabella, who really tried to sell us hard on the idea that, that this positive test for him was a complete accident. He had no idea how it happened. Do you ever believe guys when they use that excuse? Is that ever viable that there was a, a tainted pot somewhere that, that made a bad batch of normally good stuff? Uh, or is that from your experience, almost always nonsense. No, it's actually happened. And there was a case in Major League Baseball. It was um, uh, that Phillies reliever. I'm blanking on his name. He was head of University of Mobile. So I didn't know that one. Um, but he actually did have a sample of it. Now, what, one of the things Calabello did is, is he's gone back. A lot of players will take, you know, if, they, if they've got a bottle of supplement. Uh, vitamins, whatever it is, they'll take almost all of them, leave one or two in the bottle, mark the bottle, and save it. So just in case, they can have it tested. Um, gosh, I wish I could remember this guy's name, JD, JR, something like that. Um, but he actually sued the manufacturer uh, and got his money back. He still took the suspension. Um, he was taking... Uh, something like six oxo extreme and it happened to have some some uh, other things in it so it does happen but Colabello says he did all this that he saved things if this was the case if he took something that was tainted um a it probably wouldn't have been the substance he tested for that one's very unusual uh second 
he would have been able to show where it was. Mm -hmm. So essentially his excuse to me broke down his excuse. If you did all this, you should have found something. Otherwise, I just don't buy it. Well, it certainly seems like some guys still think it's worth the risk here. I mean, D. Gordon, again, he's going to miss 80 games this year. The Marlins said the day he left that we'll welcome him back right away. He's going to lose, like, less than a mil and a half of a 50-mil contract. So what in your mind, if you were Rob Manfred, if you were Tony Clark, what, where would you go in terms of the punishment scale? Would you be okay with a lifetime ban sooner than you get it right now? No, no. I think uh, you know, every time we have a positive test, people say, well, these aren't enough. It started off at 10 games, and then it went to 25 games, 50, 80. Look, people are always going to try something. You've got it down to a minuscule amount. It's six so far out of 1,400-something players. That's not bad. Uh, perfect? No, but you're never going to get to perfect. So does increasing the penalty make it less likely that anybody's going to do it? No. You know, the penalty for murder is pretty severe, and it still happens far too much uh, more than we'd want. I think in this case, yeah, they're, they talk about uh, players taking away their long-term contract. Well, yeah, take a look at Johnny Peralta a couple of years ago, coming yeah. off suspension. He walked right into a multi-year contract with the Cardinals. I, I talked to a GM the other day after D. Gordon, uh, and I was like, if D. Gordon came available as a free agent, and I, I, I didn't even have to finish my question. It's like, I'd sign him right now. And I don't think he'd sign for much less, if any, than what he signed for uh, with that, that uh, longer-term deal with the Marlins. I just don't think it would deter uh, the owners. Uh, it, it's one of those things, if a player can play – they're going to sign him. Uh, you know, Aroldis Chapman was facing a suspension. The Yankees knew about it uh, for domestic violence, and they still took him. Now, granted, different situation, uh, only only a month. But uh, if you can play, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's going to be too much of a deterrent for you. So that's Will Carroll, the managing editor at FanDuel, and a must-follow on Twitter, at Injury Expert. I've got a bunch of football injury questions for Will as well, but I guess we'll save that for Bogish under center in the fall. So this happened since we last talked here on Bogish at the plate, and we go right back to our conversation with Will. Give you the specifics on D. Gordon's 80-game PED suspension. It, it takes him out for most of this year, obviously, and in particular, don't forget, it means if the Marlins were to make the postseason, he can't play there as well. And what they lose is the reigning NL batting champ, plus 58 steals, 88 runs scored, a good defender as well. Uh, but the good news for D is that he's got four years and like $48.5 million left on his contract to start earning again once he comes back. And the Marlins can't wait for him to come back because he's good at baseball. And that is what matters most. Now, there's also his teammate, Adam Conley, who was throwing a no-hitter Friday in Milwaukee when he got to 116 pitches in the eighth inning. And he was pulled by his manager, Don Mattingly, to protect his arm. We've seen this now twice so far this year. And again, it makes sense. As cool as no-hitters are and historically relevant as they are, uh, they can come at the expense of your arm. Ask Johan Santana. And Adam Conley is young. The Marlins have high expectations for him. So you need to be careful now and maybe, just maybe, when the leashes are off, he actually can throw a full no-hitter for you then. And then finally, now this is not breaking news, uh, but it is worth pointing out especially from a Met fan who wants to hate on the Braves. The Braves are bad. We've known this from the beginning. They, they know they're bad because they're building for 2017, 2018 when they get to their new stadium. Uh, but we are seeing them be historically bad hitting. They won a franchise record 15 straight games without a home run. Freddie Freeman finally went deep in Boston to break that up. They only, though, have five home runs this season five for the season and on Monday at the Mets they allowed three home runs in one at bat for the Mets that's how bad the Braves are it's also worth noting that at one point last week the team had a lower OPS than Cubs pitchers that's right Cubs pitchers were better hitters than brave hitters I, for one, am going to celebrate the Braves being bad for as long as humanly possible. But first, we're going to check in on the bad Astros. Our good friend Mike Meltzer from Sports Radio 610 down in Houston is next. I'm Bogus at the plate.